Hello, my name is Shankar. Um, a little, really quick, a little bit about myself. Um, I gave this talk last year at for the Python group. Um, this year, uh, I was invited to give the talk here, and so I'd like to really quick ask, you know, who has actually worked with Python in the past, just so I can. Okay, wow, cool, awesome. So that means we can really blaze through these examples. Um, so I, the when I gave my talk last time, I worked at uh, Lycos, but I recently joined a startup um, right here in Cambridge, uh, Session M. And uh, basically what we do is uh, we're trying to, trying to overcome some of the challenges in mobile, uh, which is monetization, engagement, and uh, discovery. So it's a really interesting field, and this ties in a lot with that. Um, as we go through some of the examples, all of this, uh, you can grab this later from my website, which I'll show at the end, um, but it's on GitHub, all the examples. Uh, not every single one that's shown in here, but um, the ones from that I gave last year are up there. And some of the examples I'll be showing here are just slightly modified versions of those. All right, so really quick, um, what is uh, natural language processing? Basically, we're going to go through each of these steps. And so to begin, natural language processing is um, analyzing and parsing through natural language, which is what humans speak, basically. It's something that's an extremely abstract form of language, um, has a lot of challenges in actually parsing through and figuring out what's going on. And then we're going to go through where this stuff is used and some paradoxes and uh, try to really quickly glance over a few terms and then we're going to go through a quick start, create some uh, NLP apps. Alright, so it's a computer, uh, natural language processing is computer-aided text uh, analysis of uh, human language and essentially the goal is to enable computers to actually understand um, things that humans would only normally understand. Um, and it falls under the category of machine learning and more specifically, computational li linguistics. Uh, NLTK itself is a Python module, and what's really great about it is that a lot of the, the inner workings of um, how a lot of this computation, how a lot of these computations work, are concealed by this library, and so it makes it really easy for anybody really quickly to put something together that actually parses through um, text all over the web. Um, so, on the web and outside of the web, this is, these are some of the areas in which uh, natural language processing is commonly used. Uh, so search engines, um, site recommendations, spam filtering, knowledge bases, automated customer support systems, uh, consumer behavior analysis, and more commonly now in advertising as well. Uh, it's pretty insane how, how well they can target some of the ads that you come across on the sites. It's, it's almost like they know you inside and out. And here's a quick look at some of the paradoxes that you'll come across uh, in machine learning and, and sentiment analysis and uh, natural language processing. And so we'll start, you know, we have sentiment, um, ambiguity, you know, when something is said in a certain way, but it's, you don't really know what, what, it's, what it means. Um, intent, uh, things like sarcasm or uh, using slang, something which a machine cannot implicitly understand unless you feed it uh, information about, about that particular uh, uh, paradox. Uh, context, so things like emphasis. So, uh, emphasis is really something that more commonly occurs in, in spoken language, but um, a lot of times humans can actually are really good at picking that up in text without having any vocal uh, emphasis on certain words. Um, time and date, so for example, um, Google used to be a really large unfathomable number, and now it's more commonly used as a, a verb. Um, so here's an example of uh, context. Um, so I, I was sitting down to dinner a long time ago with my little sister and she asked me, uh, what's your name? And so, first off, I'm like, why she asked me this when I'm eating? <laughs> and so I said, uh, Shankar? And she goes, can you spell it? And I started, I said, yeah, S-H-A-N, and I started spelling it. All of a sudden, she goes, wrong, it's spelled I-T. And so that's somewhere where con it was, that what she said was totally taken out of context, and I scolded her for it. <laughs> so natural uh, language translation is um, a field where this is this becomes really complicated to actually understand um, some of the complex translations from one language to another. Um, one of the places where you can really see this is actually if you've used um, the Google Translation APIs and stuff like that. Uh, although it automatically generates text which humans can actually pick up and read through, it's not perfect and there's a lot of inconsistencies and you probably wouldn't use it in a production environment. 
Um, so language translation is a complicated matter, and this website uh, is a place where you can go, and it actually lets you plug in any text in English. So you go there and you plug in the text, and what it does is it actually translates it to uh, one of a couple of languages, like uh, German, um, a few a few other languages that are up there, and it translates it from, you know, so let's take German for example, it translates to German, and then back to English, and then German, and then English, until it actually is the same translation from German to English and back. So it kind of bottoms out. Uh, so something interesting I did is I went to this site um, and plugged in the problem with communication is the illusion that it has occurred. And so we start off with our English phrase. Gets translated, I'm not going to actually read this, but uh, it gets translated to German. And back to English. And you'll see it's already starting to, to lose some of the meaning just after one, <coughs> one pass through. Back to German, and then this is where it bottoms out. And we end up with the problem with communication is the illusion which developed it. And so you'll see this is something that's common amongst uh, several translation systems. Uh, it's never perfect. Um, here's actually a sentence, which is, this is taken straight from the NLTK book, um, police, 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 which is actually totally syntactically correct. Uh, there's the con it's a full, complete thought. Um, and it could actually, what it actually means is police officers, police, other police officers. And so now it starts to make sense. But if you fed this, uh, if you tried to actually parse this out from a large uh, corpus, it's going to be very difficult without the right context. And there's another example of where if you give it some kind of a context, it might be easier depending on what you see around it. So some key terms. Uh, we're going to go through the NLP pipeline. So traditionally, this is the actual pipeline in which things are processed. Um, there's kind of three steps that you go through. This doesn't apply to everything, but it usually this is this is the usual that you would see. So you start with segmentation, which is given any chunk of text, basically break it up into things called tokens, which uh, you could break up by white space um, and punctuation. There's several ways you could actually segment it. Um, the normalization phase is then you take those uh, tokens and you actually pull out some of the words that you don't need. So things like stop words, which are commonly used English words. Um, so like the for example, you, it, you would want to pull things like that out. And then the final step of this process is named entity recognition, which you actually go in and pick out named entities or things of significance, so people, places, things. And you use that to then further refine it to um, get a result for what you're looking for. So we have also a, a term here, collocations, which are short sequences of uh, words that commonly occur together. They're seen together. Um, we have engrams, which are actual chunks, uh, tokens that consist of more than one word. So, I mean, actually you do have unigrams, you have bigrams, trigrams, and basically it's, it's, these are the types of tokens that we have. So, jumping into NLTK, how many people have actually used NLTK in the past? Okay. So there's a lot of people here that, that have used Python in the past, but haven't really jumped into NLTK. So we'll go through uh, setting it up and actually getting some of the data that you need and all the setup that's required before you can actually get uh, become active using it. Um, so it's, it's available for Mac, Linux, Windows, and uh, there's also installable packages, uh, or you can use Easy Install. Um, so that's the site you can actually go to download it. And you can, uh, well, some of the prerequisites are NumPy and SciPy. Um, if you've used any, any kind of uh, computational libraries before, you've probably already had this installed. So one of the things that you'll need to actually get rolling in this and do some of the more complex examples is actually download uh, the, the core bar that's available. Um, so essentially open up a, a, a command prompt and you can type, it, type in Python and then import NLTK and type in NLTK.download. And this will actually um, bring up kind of a, a little GUI that lets you uh, install a lot of the, uh, the, the core bar that come with NLTK. Um, and this GUI actually it, uh, requires the TK inter module. And at the bottom there, you'll see there's another way you can actually um, install, uh, get the downloader without having to go through the GUI if you're using a terminal only um, console. Okay. So this is kind of what it looks like, and you can actually go through and select some of the uh, packages that you want. Okay. So let's dive into some code. Um, so here's some uh, part of speech tagging. So. In many applications, you're going to want to know the parts of speech, and that's to kind of uh, break apart different grammars by function and what they do. Um, 
So essentially, what we're going to do is start off by importing uh, NLTK, um, and specifically uh, in NLTK, import the uh, part of speech tag, so POS tag, and word tokenized modules. And so it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. One of them is a word tokenizer that breaks up the sentence into uh, tokens of, of words. And the other one is a part of speech tagger. And it's as simple as actually initially just calling the word tokenize, and then immediately after tagging it with parts of speech. And it's that simple. It's, it's pretty abstracted out to the point where you don't really need to understand what's going on. But it spits out um, all the word tokens and their parts of speech. So. Here's the pen bank part of speech tags. So when it spits it out, go back to this slide, you'll see the tags that are associated in each tuple. Um, so it'll be the word and the actual tag. And this is what they correspond to. And they're available, uh, you can actually, it's a huge list. You can actually view it at that site at the bottom. And so here's a NLTK text module, um, which basically provides a lot of common functionalities for um, dealing with text. And you'll see it's pretty flexible. So once you instantiate an NLTK text object, you can actually run several different uh, functions on it. So uh, some of this is you can actually get the categories for any given word. Um, you can actually get uh, the number of collocations of that particular word. Um, and there's several other things you can actually do. You can do dispersion plots um, and frequencies of a word appearing within a large chunk of text. You can even find similar words. So if you give it humor, it will actually bring up words that are similar to that. And it's things that you can see commonly used in several different applications. And one of the, uh, the, the corpuses that are available with this is um, the WordNet corpus. And you can actually do some pretty interesting things with it. Um, so things called uh, synsets or groups of words that uh, essentially fit together and uh, mean almost the same thing or have different meanings, you can actually extract using this module. And so from, uh, we're going to import LTK, and from the corpus uh, package we're going to import WordNet. And let's take a look at the word phone and we'll grab all the synsets for that. And the bottom statement there just prints out, loops through and prints out each synset. And so, number one, it's an electronic equipment that converts sound into electrical signals, so forth. Number two is a phonetics, an individual sound unit of speech. Um, and so it gives you all the different uh, uh, definitions or ways that it can be used. And here's a sins definition. And it can be modified to actually output several different instances, several different things that are associated with that particular word. Um, in the last talk I gave, I actually went through each of these examples. Um, I don't think we'll have time for that, it's been cut out. Uh, so a couple of fun things to try. There's actually a chatbot. Um, it's pretty highly configurable within NLTK. Um, you essentially import from NLTK chat, uh, Eliza, and there's actually several flavors to choose from. And uh, you do Eliza, Eliza.chat, and it actually starts a chatbot. Um, she can keep you busy all day. And here's actually the example uh, from previously when we went to the site. It's actually built into um, the NLTK book modules, which are available on Google Code. And uh, it, it creates this, if you go over there and you import this and you start uh, Babelized Shell, you can actually feed it a sentence and then feed it a language, and it'll do that translation until it bottoms out. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting to see some of the things that, that can come out of this. All right, let's build something even cooler. So this, this is going to be like more than just a smaller example. This is something you might immediately be able to apply to something that you're working on. Um, a really quick and dirty spam filter. It's by no means the most complex thing in the world. It's really simple. Uh, but it's just going to show some of the functionalities that come together using NLTK. Um, so we're going to create a program that analyzes legitimate emails and looks at spam and learns the features that are associated with each. So once we train the program to actually understand what spam is and what ham is and what the features are for each, we can basically feed it an email and it will be able to actually categorize it. So you're going to need um, NLTK and you're also going to need a good data set of spam and ham and a lot of patience as well. And we're going to find some great data using the Enron email data set, which was actually publicly, is actually publicly available. And it's uh, pretty interesting. It's, it's a set of uh, 200,000 and more uh, emails that were made public after the Enron scandal. And it contains uh, a lot of spam, which you can find commonly. I mean, you can probably find an entire data set right in your spam folder, and actual corporate ham. So this is a good, reliable source of emails that were actually created by humans. 
and circulated. And so for this reason, for um, developing anti-spam software, this is one of the, more, uh, the most commonly used data sets. Um, there's a link if you want to uh, download that. Once again, this, these slides will be available on my site, so you can just, it's a really long link, but you can grab it from the site. So we're going to extract this data set, and it'll immediately, if you get it from the link that I, that I showed in the previous slide, it'll immediately spit out two folders, spam and ham. So it's really, I picked this uh, particular version of it because it already pre-formatted the folders for us. Um, and we're going to create a Python script. You can call it whatever you'd like. Um, I'm going to call it spambot.py. And in your working directory, you're just going to put this in there, and that folder is going to contain the script and these two folders. And this is the beginning of that script. We're going to call, we're going to call in from NLTK uh, word tokenize, uh, word lemmatizer, uh, and a Bayesian classifier. Actually, I don't think you need the last one, but um, just a Bayesian classifier. And then from for uh, uh, Corpus, we're going to import stop words, which is, again, the words that you need to take out from text. Words that are commonly seen everywhere that, that they don't really have any kind of significance. Um, <clears throat> All right, so we're going to instantiate a, uh, the word net lemmatizer, and basically what that does is it reduces a word to its uh, its um, its lowest form. So essentially, jump like for the word jump, you would have uh, jumped jumps several different tenses, several different ways it can be used. Lemmatizer will reduce that to just just jump. Um, Common words, we're going to instantiate, we're going to put all those stop words for English, and there's actually several languages supported by MLTK, uh, but we're going to use the English uh, stop words corpus and actually load a list of that into a variable, and we're going to create, instantiate lists to hold um, both spam and ham. And as we go through things, we're actually going to glob through each of, each of the files within the ham folder and the spam folder, and fill up those, uh, those two lists with emails. So, once we have a list uh, with both spam and ham emails, we're actually going to go and assign labels to them. So, we're going to spit out tuples with, uh, with the appropriate label for each one. <coughs> and after this, now that we have these two lists, both containing labeled emails of spam and ham, we're going to create uh, a feature extractor. Essentially, something we're going to pass these emails through to, and it's going to be able to actually pull out, as we define it, pull out certain features that we think are significant to um, emails. And we're going to randomly shuffle these emails and start defining our feature extractor. So for something like this, uh, it's really simple. Uh, we're actually going to take it, take the word uh, tokens, lemmatize it, and then if it's not in common words, so if it's not uh, a common word, we're going to store it um, in a dictionary like object and just say that word exists, so we're going to set it to true. And in the end, we're going to return that feature that we extracted. We're going to run every single individual email through this feature extractor. So all the output for each email will be just the features that we came up with. So for something like this, uh, especially with, the, with this classifier, they must be binary features, something that's true or false. Um, and if it's something that's non-binary, you've got to find a way to, to make it binary by, uh, in a process called binning. Okay, so we're going to grab a sampling of, we're going to split this data set in half. So if you recall, we actually randomly shuffled them. We're going to split them in two. And so we're going to have actually a training set and a test set. The training set is what we're going to use to actually, um, to actually train the program to understand what spam and ham is. The test set is what we're going to actually run it through to test to see um, how precise it is. And at the bottom here, you'll see we actually run the training set, so, which is uh, actually just a list of uh, dictionary objects that contain the features. We're just going to simply pass it through that uh, Bayesian classifier. <coughs> and then after, this, this is the part where it takes a really long time. So after about a couple minutes, depending on how much data you're actually crunching through, we're going to actually print out um, the labels. So we have ham and spam. And then we can actually print out the accuracy. And you can actually see a lot of the words that are, it'll print out, if you print out uh, show most informative features, as simple as that, you can actually specify the number of informative features you want to print out. It'll actually dump out um, a list of words that were tagged as being significant, uh, both spam and ham. And so you'll, you'll actually come up with a lot of funny things, especially where I actually manually had to remove some of the terms that came up on here. So, um, 
So here's a little loop that I wrote so that once it was done classifying, it would just stop and it would just, uh, while true, it would go through and actually prompt you to enter something. So you could actually enter a string, you could copy and paste an email into it, and immediately hit enter and it'll actually classify it. And it'll spit out, you know, oh, what you just entered was spam or, or ham. So you can see how spammy uh, what you write is. And so the quality of your input, uh, input data will affect the accuracy of the classifier. Um, so basically, you want to refine uh, your selection of data to, until it reaches um, the maximum accuracy. And so there's a lot of playing around with the numbers, um, the size of the data set, um, and how you, actually, how you actually refine it will be different from, from data set to data set. We'll, we'll jump right into this. So this is a continuation of that, um, that classifier program that we just wrote, except this is going to use the Twitter streaming API to actually classify uh, movie reviews as either positive or negative in real time. So this is something that's really interesting. Uh, maybe there's no real uh, utility to it, but it's, it's pretty fun to watch it. So we're going to use that same script, and at the bottom you're, you'll see the link to actually getting the Rotten Tomatoes uh, polarity data set. So they have a data set that is a bunch of compiled uh, reviews, both positive and negative, of, different, of several different movies. Um, and so from that data set, you can actually use this as your training uh, data, and so that your program will actually understand what a positive review is and what a negative review is. So we're going to have two labels, um, either rotten or fresh, and any, any given tweet will actually fit into one of these two. And I'm going to use Green Lantern as an example. I don't know if anyone really likes this movie a lot, but you might see some negative reviews. <laughs> Um, we're going to start off by e doing easy install of TweetStream, which is a Python module for the real-time Twitter API. And we're going to import that into our script. And for words, this is something that's part of the TweetStream API. You can specify words for which um, it'll actually stream through. So if I give it Green Lantern, it'll actually give me tweets that are related to Green Lantern. Um, so before this, since this is a continuation of the previous script, uh, before this we would have already had a um, uh, feature extractor. So similar process with using the ham and spam, except this time you do the exact same thing using the um, positive or negative reviews. Um, the structure of that full, uh, of that data set is almost exactly the same. You can just extract it right into working directory. So let's assume you already have uh, you've already trained this classifier with the Rotten Tomatoes data set. Um, you can actually go through and you know for each tweet that's coming through the stream. You're going to get the um, you're going to get the actual screen name. You're going to get what the actual um, text is, and you're going to pass it through the uh, feature extractor, just as you did using the training data. And in the end, it'll actually spit out whether that review was uh, was rotten or fresh. And so it, it's pretty interesting to see it as it comes through live data um, what these reviews are. Oh, you'll notice I actually flipped the, the rotten and fresh review, so what you're seeing here, you'll see like mess comes up as fresh, and uh, engrossing comes up as rotten, but I, it's, it's my mistake, I flipped the two labels. But <laughs> uh, Here's some further resources, so I'm going to be uploading this to my website, um, shankarambadi.com, and that's also listed in the, uh, the meetup description. Um, there's the NLTK book, it's free, you can view it online. And... Uh, there's the API reference. You can actually grab uh, user contributed modules from Google Code. So, thank you for watching, and special thanks to <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, I don't know if this is off topic, but are you actually applying this in your mobile work? Uh, I will be, yeah. So, <coughs> using Apple? Data or other data? Not Twitter data, um, other data. So this applies to any kind of contextual data you can mine from basically any source. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting some of the stuff you can do and it's a field where you can get really creative and discover new ways to actually get this kind of data and mine something from it. So, Yes, I think this, we, I think this will be the last one, right? Because we don't have much time. Right? How often do you think you need to retrain the, uh, the classifier with that's that's a good question. Um, it's it's it really depends on the data that you're dealing with. For so for example, um, in terms of email, one time uh, in the past you might have um, you might have classified it and it detects like a reply within the subject header as being an indicator that it is legitimate email because people commonly reply to emails. 
you'll notice now actually uh, spammers adjusted to that and now started putting reply in the subject header line to get around that. And so it needs to be retrained. And so depending on what kind of data you're dealing with, it'll have different intervals for which it needs to be retrained. That's a good question. Can a handle coming supervised where you not be trained completely with this other ad? Um, in, well, see, in, in most of these algorithms, you're going to have to recompute the probabilities between uh, every piece of data in there, but 